Mukti ma'am, can you please so, take it over? So this I'm meeting is being recorded. But sir, am I audible? Please? Yeah, madam, you are audible, ma'am. Thank you. You're audible, madam. Go ahead. Yes. So, good afternoon to all present in this session of distinguished guest lecture series, which is organized by Bites in association with the Anand Sagar University. As part of this lecture series, today we have the opportunity to get essential points of knowledge from Professor S.K. Sinha, who is chairman and chief architect at Lab to Market Innovations Private Limited. He's also a former professor of ISC. Professor Sinha will talk to us about the industry academia divide and will take us through some measures and products that can help us bridge this gap. Professor Sinha, thank you for giving us this chance to hear from you. And I, on behalf of Bytes and DSU, welcome you to this session. I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. K.N.B. Murthy, Chairman Bytes and Vice Chancellor of DSU, who has facilitated this chance of enhancing our practices at DSU. I welcome Professor Arvind Srinivas, Dr. Puttamadappa C, Registrar DSU, Dr. A. Srinivas, Dean, DSU School of Engineering, Dr. Vaibhav Meshra, Chairman, Department of ECE, Thank you, Dr. Gidisha GS, Chairman, Department of CSE, and respected Chairman of all the departments to this session. I welcome all the faculty members and students of DSU who are looking forward to this enlightening session. I now request Dr. Weber to kindly introduce the speaker to the gathering. Thank you, Mukti, ma'am. It's an indeed pleasure to introduce Professor Sinha. Uh, Professor Sinha did his B in Electrical Engineering from Bihar College of Engineering, Patna, now NIT Bihar, and ME and PhD in Electrical Engineering from ISC Bangalore. On completion of his uh, doctoral program, Professor Sinha was offered a faculty position in the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIS, where he worked till 1995. Sir set up a new parallel computing lab in the electrical engineering department, and most of the, his research efforts were directed towards applying the parallel and distributed computing technique for the industrial drive applications. Sir then moved over to the Center for Electronic Design and Technology, CEDT, at IISC, where he set up an embedded system laboratory. The lab has now matured into a leading training and development center in the area of embedded computing. He retired from ISE in 2011 and after a few years of preparation, set up a lab to market innovation, private limited at ISE. The initiative is seed funded by ISE, which also holds equity in the company. Lab to market is an innovating product and solution to make railway safer and more efficient. It will be indeed a play, great pleasure to listen to Professor Sinha, and I hope students make the best use of this session. Thank you, Mukti ma'am. Thank you, sir, for joining the session. Thank you. Mukti ma'am, over to you. I also request um, Professor, uh, I also request our vice, Honorable Vice Chancellor to say a few words. Before starting no, no, the I session. think we will listen to Professor uh, Sina. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's great. It's <laughs> yeah, I'm eagerly waiting for uh, Yeah, we are, we are also eagerly waiting. Yeah, so yeah. indeed, it will sir, be over to you, sir. Yes. Over to you, sir, Thank Professor Sina. Thank you very much. Thank you very yeah. much, sir. And uh, I will place. share my Thank screen you. now. And, uh, Please, sir. Yes, sir, it's visible. Sir, you can put it in. Ah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Completely visible. Okay, so uh, basically the uh, topic is industry academia interaction, and I am going to talk about uh, what basically is our concept, how we are trying to work on this direction. Basically, uh, I first want to start with talk about why it is, doesn't happen the way we all want it to happen. And then uh, I will talk about uh, how lab to market is trying to create a bridge on which this interaction can, have, can be much better than what it is now. Then I will, after, all, after that, I will talk about uh, our lab to market and uh, our 
current partners. And if time permits, uh, a glimpse into what work we have done so far. <clears throat> uh, before I start, I would like to quote from an inscription on the statue of Jamshed Ji Tata, the founder of IIAC, which is there in front of the main building. Uh, among other things, uh, what he said, the reasons for founding IIC was to provide for advanced instruction and to conduct original investigation in all branches of knowledge. In particular, in such branches of knowledge as are likely to promote the material and industrial welfare of India. So the founder had this vision right from the very beginning that it was not an academic institution which will just award degrees but he was thinking in terms of creating people and a knowledge base for material and industrial welfare. But, and, and IIC has tried, it's not that IIC did not try it. There are a lot of windows which IIC operates for interaction with the industry, with the government, there are several windows which are doing reasonably well, particularly the space technology cell and IIC and DRDO. JAT uh, program, uh, Joint Advanced Technology Program. Then there is a biotechnology unit separately, and then uh, for technology development mission. So these windows are there, and which they are fairly, I would say, successful. However, what is not so successful is are our windows with the industry. The primary window is the Center for Scientific and Industrial Consultancy, then SID, Society for Innovation and Development. There is a continuing education uh, unit and also for a sponsored dessert. So in spite of all that effort and the continuous push for that, it hasn't happened the way uh, one would like to have it. And it's not just with IIC, it's everywhere. All institutions are trying very hard. All IITs I know are trying very hard, but it doesn't happen. So some of the reasons which I have learned from my colleagues at IAC during my long tenure there and after also interacting with the industry a lot is this and the, the biggest gap that I have realized is that industry is looking for products they are not interested in proof of concept or some designs or some ideas they they in particularly in India they just want something which can they can take to production or uh, you know implement it straight away in the ground and sell that doesn't happen uh, because academic institutions uh, are not equipped to develop products to make products or to make production prototypes they what they produce basically are core technology and that too the core technologies are not a result of any uh, targeted, uh, you know, product development. These core technologies come from the basic research, which is through student guidance. And then they are, you know, known to public only through publications and the, and the students who work on that. So these are all what uh, some people call university stage inventions. They are definitely not ready-made products. And uh, uh, however, they are needed if I want to make new products, if I want to come out with something totally different from what is available in the market today, we need these core technologies. And uh, however, using these core technology, when you want to develop something, very large amount of investment is required in manpower and in time and in equipment. But then the question arises that once you do that, who is going to buy it? Where are you going to sell it? Who is going to fund it? So this, this is a very risky investment if you just do it without answering these questions. Okay. So because of this, you know, I, I, I can also put it like this, that, uh, you know, somebody goes to a grocery store and ask for biryani. A grocery store will have rice, will have the lentils, will have the spices. But then somebody has to pick them up and then uh, create a recipe and then uh, make it. So that is the problem. The, our our uh, academic institutions are like the grocery stores, but industry are asking for the ready-made the food. It's not going to happen. 
and if the is academic institutions decide to develop the products on themselves then who is going to buy it who is going to fund that development so this gap is very much very clear to me which i wanted to bridge and uh, another thing what i have also learned over the years is that there is is a big difference in the way the minds in academia work vis-a-vis the minds in industry first let's look at the motivation what mot- motivates an industry person no industry can survive if it is spends more than what it earns so there has to be a profit for the industry to you know remain alive let alone grow whereas academic institutions don't work like that a, a typical academic researcher is working to gain the peer respect they are, they are not there to make money or to keep uh, the institute uh, running by their work so this is one of the biggest differences the way the very motivation to work towards work is is so far apart then if you look at the time schedules industry when it starts a project it defines a time that two years three years one year it has to complete in academia we of course when we take up a research student we nominally fix 3 years but uh, quite often that 3 year can become 4 year 5 year 6 years i have seen b- longer periods also and that is accepted in, in case because we know that when you are trying to do research we are, you are trying to find out something new uh, you may not be able to meet the timelines very strictly now this becomes a big problem for industries because industry has a project for a defined time they assign manpower they assign budget for a certain period of time and if that keeps on exceeding then they don't know what to do with it so that is another reason why many uh, this kind of joint research or joint work have failed in the past to my knowledge then when it comes to what interests them an industry has a one particular domain in which it works that's not so for academic people we keep changing our domain we we work in something uh, I, i would take my my example i was trained in power electronics when i did my research uh, that, that that's where i earned my uh, doctorate but then uh, if i if i where, where did i end i ended up doing industrial iot and embedded domain i set up that embedded system laboratory because times are changing technologies are changing and academic people have to be on the forefront of that so we cannot have very specific areas of interest if we confine ourselves to a very specific domain uh, we will lose uh, our significance very soon so i mean what what uh, people like to call we will become dead wood so if we do not want to become dead wood we can't be very specific remain as to a very narrow domain we have to have generic interest that's another problem then feasibility concern this is a thing which very often breaks this connection you know in an industry if it starts a project failure is not an option you imagine that somebody some organization is assigning a 2 crore budget for a project to two years duration so many manpower are done after 2 years if the team comes back and tells management that sorry we have failed and that's not on whereas in academics i am very fond of saying this that there is nothing like a failure because what happens is that we we expected to do something but we got something else or we have done some work in a particular way and it didn't work so that's also not a failure that also is a result for us we can report that okay Uh, when you try to work like this uh, this is what you get some somebody else may benefit from that so there is nothing like a failure in academic research you may have unexpected outcomes but whereas an unexpected outcome in an industry is a failure and then who pays for that failure that that's the question so this is another thing which we have to keep in mind why this interaction doesn't happen then interest in the area is is long term and uh, we have to, we work with a time period of 
our a student's career a, we get a student phd 3 years 4 years and that's it after that another student comes and then we have another problem to work with so in our lifetime we would have worked in many different problems very different areas together whereas now i am working with the railways they tell us that look uh, the life of our coach is 25 years so anything that you do you have to keep in mind that it should work for 25 years so this is this is not uh, what academics think of you make something prove it move on publish it and move on then team effort in industry it has to be there always nobody can make a product alone because all products by necessity are have multi dimensions and they are multidisciplinary where an academics as we all know with due regards to all of us Uh, two academic people very really rarely agree on one issue so we generally like to avoid conflicts by working alone so most of us work in in our own silos where industry likes to work with a team and then confidentiality for industry it is a lifeline they have to keep their research or their innovation confidential where an academic person has to publish it if they want to grow if they want to gain respect no academic person can grow without publishing so this is another road block but in this list what i feel that the biggest problems that i have noticed are the two that is one is the time schedule that 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 is a real problem that uh, which which can be a deal breaker and another uh, is the feasibility concern okay these two are the real deal breakers of course every all other points are important but these two in my mind are the most critical issues which very often uh, break that connection between industry and academia so this is this is what i wanted to just put first to summarize what i have understood is the real issue and have having understood this or having realized this i had this concept of lab to market this was basically to bridge these gaps and overcome these obstacles of opposing mindset so the lab to market works to isolate industry from academia in one sense like it provides like a flexible coupling even if the two are not properly aligned it will still rotate each other that that's that what lab to market concept is it took me quite some time to convince iisc that this is a good idea to work with because it was something very new and uh, normally uh, all all incubators including iisc are used to youngster going to with an idea that looks at this is what i want to make into a product and sell and they evaluate and do it here there is a 72 year old man going there and telling that look i am going to make a connection between you and industry and this is my approach this was this it took some time convincing them but finally i am very happy that it happened iisc agreed okay this is our strategy the way we work is that first we keep ourselves aware of what is happening in the academic institution we just keep around keep an eye on all the uh, conference proceedings we try and attend as many seminars and conferences as possible and keep ourselves abreast of what new has happened yeah, what new academic institutions have produced I, i i i try to do that in india only i am not bothered about other uh, countries i i like to work only with indian academics so uh, we i am i am i confine myself to that then after having identified the seed technology we also try to find out who would be interested in using this technology to whom this technology can be adapted to of course no no technology has a direct relevance to any other thing it has to be adapted so we identify partner organization who would be willing to invest in that because if you recall in the first i had gap i had mentioned that substantial investment is required 
which can be very risky if we do not know what to do with that outcome. So to manage that risk, we first go and find out who would want to use a product out of this technology and will they be uh, willing to invest? So that is the second step. Then the third step is to collaborate the, with the institution from where that C technology has come or any other organization which has the facilities for us to create a product or a solution out of the C technology. Because we can't invest crores of rupees in uh, creating the uh, research facility or the labs what are required. I will give you some examples later of this. So again, there will be, this could be the, the institution where the C technology came from, or this could be some other organization. After that, once I have got this, I have got the core technology, I have got somebody willing to invest in it, and I have made arrangements with another institution which has the, uh, all the equipment and manpower to support the development. Then we set up our teams in the lab to market who would work with uh, the researchers in the academic institutions and the other laboratories and to develop the products which will be in the industry need. And here, when I talk about product, it is a ruggedized certified product that will meet the uh, re requirements or what we, what we call is that, um, I mean, we start working with the user specifications but then we, we go to the SRS system requirement and specification and meet item by item, we have to meet. So this is, this is a very tough process. It takes a lot of time and it requires people who are not necessarily academic, but who understand uh, the rigor of uh, doing this. So those teams are set up. And once we do that, once we have proven it on the ground, then comes the revenue generation which in our case is by licensing it or by uh, selling it outright to maybe the partner company which invested in it in the first place. Lab to market does not want to get into manufacturing or contracting to supply solution in the long term. We have to do it one or two or three initially to show that it, yes, it works. But after that, we do not want to get into project management or contracting and all that because our strength is basically to innovate, to create new technology, to work with researchers and keep innovating and creating IP for ourselves, for the nation. So we don't want to get bogged down by the uh, re regular industry issues. So this is, this is our strategy with which we are working. Our IIC connection is uh, uh, very strong. We have an, uh, I mean, it's seat funded uh, by IIC. We have got a plug and play place at IIC. Even tea and coffee we get for free. And uh, IIC holds equity in our company. We, the new thing, extra thing that we do is we pay them, we have agreed to pay 1% royalty on our revenue. For every 100 rupees that we, get, uh, we pay one rupee to IAC, but as against that, we have been given access to all their laboratories. We have access to all the patents which we can use and we can uh, engage with IAC faculty in the priority basis for uh, joint project. Then the resulting IAPs, uh, IPs are also shared with IAC. Suppose we, we create some intellectual property or a patent that is owned jointly by lab to market and IAC. So this is our IAC connection. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful campus. I don't have to tell you. It can be quite colorful also in some seasons. We have um, 500 plus faculty for more than 5,000 students. More than half of these students are pursuing their PhD. The founding team, one is, is myself, so I, I have you have already been told about me, so I would skip. And uh, the other co-founder uh, is uh, Mr. Rao, Mr. Rao, S. Rao Ganapa. He was an IRS, Indian Railway Services officer in the signaling engineering department. And after working for 12 years, he resigned and he has started his own company to produce signaling engineers, whom he started deploying all over the world. He had a very successful company 
and um, at one point of time he uh, he had more than 800 employees and uh, he, he he made some good amount of money but then being a first time entrepreneur and coming from a very humble background uh, you know he made mistakes and he was also shortchanged by the investors and he lost those companies subsequently but he made some other companies and all that so he is uh, not just a hardened railway engineer he also a serial entrepreneur and uh, it's thanks to him that i am able to uh, you know work without bothering too much about the business development and financial management aspects of the uh, of any commercial organization then we have uh, interestingly um, this was also a new concept for iic at that time when I had made this proposal, I also told them that I would need to consult IIC faculty, but I don't have money to pay them to begin with. So uh, can I can I give them some equity and in, in return of that equity, they should be permitted to provide us their consultancy. So again, this was something new. Uh, they did not, but finally, uh, Institute agreed. And uh, we had, these are the four who are also part of the, you can say, the founding team from day one, Professor K.J. Vinay, he is presently the chairman of EC, and Professor Umanan, who is chairman of DESE, that earlier it was CDT, now he is the chairman, the power electronics man, Dr. T.V. Prabhakar, that he, I like to call him a zero energy man, because he likes to work on IoT systems, low power, and Haresh Dagle, who is into embedded systems and uh, security cyber security so they are they are with us in this now after that we started also engaging with psus because the psus in india have massive facility and iic even though it can support us you know in in giving things to a uh, to a level but beyond that it becomes very difficult for iic faculty to support us by way of infrastructure because iic infrastructure is you know di designed for research to support research not to support production whereas in psus they have infrastructure to support production also so once we are we have got something from iic for proof of concept at the second level we need some bigger facilities again there is no way we can invest that kind of money. So I started talking to uh, different companies and uh, I have been fairly successful, touch wood in this. We have an MOU with NAL in Bangalore. They are helping us. I will, this FPG census, I will talk about it in a moment. Then this Raja Ramana Center for Advanced Technology. This is a surprise induction to us because this is a totally closed unit of atomic energy is not accessible to uh, outsiders but uh, they had a facility which nobody else had that is to uh, create the sensors that i was using as i said i will come to this sensors in a moment so this sensor was critically important for us and iic had the laboratory facility they could give us four or five sensors but they can't give they couldn't give us hundreds which we needed and rrcat had that facility which they had created in-house themselves because nobody in the world touches rrcat uh, because they belong to atomic energy so when i went and talked to them and all that the director was impressed and uh, uh, he's surprisingly he agreed to help us he said that we cannot support you in the sense that we cannot sell the sensors to you but if you want for R&D purpose, we will give it to you for free. And we have got hundreds of sensors from RRCAT. Now, of course, they have modified it. We are going to get incubated at uh, RRCAT uh, in the, under the ATAL incubation, and then we will be able to use their sensors for commercial purposes also. Then C. Bangalore is another unit with which whom we have <coughs> uh, a tie-up now with an MOU. And they are providing us uh, with wireless communication systems. Of course, anything in that, uh, when the first time it is tried, it fails. So C dot equipment also, when we started working with, did not work. But we gave them feedback. We worked with them. 
and they also work very hard and i am now happy to tell you that their equipment are working beautifully with us in the railway domain we are the first people and the only people in the country who have deployed c dot wireless system successfully for railway application everything else that you see in the metros or in the indian railways 100% important except what we have done then uh, there is another lab in chennai uh, that is a structural engineering research center that's a fabulous lab when it comes to a structural uh, engineering uh, in general and uh, we are uh, we we were asked by another uh, railway unit to work on a structural health monitoring of railway structures and now we have tied up with them to support us so these are the four large psus with whom we now already have mous and we are actively engaged with them and if i if i if i look at the uh, in terms of money how much of infrastructure has become available to us by working with these unit it would be maybe 1 lakh crore i don't know i mean no no industry can even dream of having the kind of infrastructure with which we work to innovate our products and this is thanks to these organizations <coughs> then we have academic partners vnit nagpur for defense related projects we have tie up in them in bangalore oxford college of engineering we have an mou <coughs> we already heard from professor vaibhav that one of their students is working with us then for svit sai vidya institute of technology in yalahanka we are working with them we have we have actually set up a lab there they have given us two large rooms in uh, their college and where we have set up this uh, cyber signaling lab we we have lot of uh, our uh, scientific staff working in that college and we have also taken student interns this is the second year we have taken first year we took 11 this year we have taken 15 then from kcg college of technology in chennai we have made a tie up because of uh, that secrc in chennai and uh, we needed some academic person to work on our behalf with secrc so this college has provided that and i am hoping i have i have graded it because this is proposal stage but i am very sure this will happen and we will have a unit at uh, the anand sagar college of engineering so our current focus is uh, on railways we are we are we are concentrating our efforts to work for railways and we want to work for enhance the efficiency and safety there are a lot of issues the railways world over face even though railways have been there for 300 years there are issues which are maybe 300 years old and uh, now the technology allows many things to be done which are not being done and we are trying to get into that so mainly challenges the biggest challenge in railways in our opinion is that their monitoring systems are mostly manual whether it is track you know even every every piece of track is, is a safety hazard and the way that it is maintained is that one guy walks for 8 km with a long hammer and he keeps hitting it listens to the sound and from there he a person perceives whether it is good to go but that's done once in a day or at the most twice in a day what happens in between there is there is no nobody knows then moving assets they have engines coaches wagons these are also monitored only when they complete their journey and come back to the home station then they are inspected in between while there is a running we have no way the driver doesn't know if anything wrong is happening somewhere <coughs> so there is no information about the critical assets in real time the train drivers don't know what is happening they just simply keep driving if the signal is there they will go if the signal is red they will stop and if somebody if there is a critical situation suppose for some reason the drivers are not in a position to do their work they get incapacitated for some reason there is no way we can apply brakes remotely so we have created three separate kind of verticals to 
to manage these issues one we call oms online monitoring system another we that is on the track side we put systems <laughs> then we have obcms that on board condition monitoring systems things that we put on the uh, uh, rolling stock and the third is the signaling what we have call what we call cyber signaling or cyber physical system for railways so these three are the areas in which broad areas in which we are working now the projects which we have already implemented are what is known as wheel impact load detector i will give you a glimpse brief of all this then uh, there is a uh, cyber signaling which which requires remote operation of uh, point machines for route setting and also for detecting track occupancy or vacancy and then we have some on board condition monitoring system so let me just take a minute uh, to tell you uh, because not all of us would be familiar with apg we came to know about fiber brag rating sensing technology when we attended a, a seminar organized by ieee sensors sensor society in which professor ashokan of our iap uh, department he made a uh, presentation he gave a talk on that then i talked to him we realized that this can be applied to railways it had not been done so far and then um, he helped us initially and that's how it all started so this fpg is essentially a kind of a refract a mirror a selective mirror which are created in the uh, optical fiber the same fiber which is used for communication telecommunication network so you create some kind of a grating and that becomes a sensor this is short video shows how it becomes a sensor so let let this video explain itself to you intense ultraviolet light is put on a cooled fiber through a mask which creates these gratings and once these gratings are created then a very narrow bandwidth of light gets reflected normally in a in a fiber whatever light enters is exiting at the other end there is total internal reflection and hardly any thing is lost but when we create this grating a very narrow band we are explained it written here as lambda b on the lower left corner that is reflected now if this fiber is stretched this lambda b changes to some lambda b1 if it is compressed it will change to some lambda b2 what optical scientists call blue shift and red shift and it is also sensitive to temperature and other things so this is the property which we are using in our systems that when we have made this sensor and if a load comes on that it will get stretched lambda will will change to some lambda b1 lambda b2 and knowing the difference between the original lambda b and the reflected wavelength we know how much strain has come on that that is in short the working principle on which we are we have developed the sensor when we put the sensors at the bottom of the rail this is how we uh, get this is an actual video taken that you see this your two yellow lines the apg sensor is clamped under the rail between these two yellow lines and as the wheels go over the sensor this is how we get the data so this is the data we capture and then make use of for our work this these are the typical uh, you know signatures of two trains that i have shown one is of a rajdhani upper one and the lower one is the shatabdi express so this is the kind of data that we get from these sensors and then we have to make sense of it okay. uh, you know if we, if we expand that this is how it looks this is the first on the left side what you see is the signature of a locomotive they they have got three and three axles then the other one is a loaded wagon goods wagon goods wagon then if the wagon is not loaded it is significantly less so we are able to gather lot of information from this this is the work that we are doing and this is the work which we invite researchers from academic institutions to look at it and tell us what more can we do with this data 
So one of the important things that we, we have done is what we call wheel impact load detector. That is the system to detect defective wheels. Uh, you know, wheels can get defective on the right hand side. You see this small patch over here. This is the patch caused by, uh, you know, what they railway people call brake binding. Suppose the brakes got jammed and failed to release, it will get dragged and create a bad patch there. But in the extreme cases, it can even become like this, in which case definitely there will be a derailment. But even if there is no derailment, what the railway people are most worried about is what you see on the left hand side. You know, it damages the rail. And once damaged, you know, it is a big problem. They can't run another train on that. And or even if they run, they have to run it at a very slow speed. Then changing is a very expensive affair. So this is what they want to avoid. And of course, in extreme cases, there will be derailments. Then there is a big problem. But even if there is no derailment, this damage to the rails is, is a huge uh, issue with the railways. So we have developed, uh, and, and when we capture the wheel signature, if there is a flat wheel or defective wheel, typically we will get a signal like this. So this is this big peak that you see is because of a bad wheel that we, we had in that system. So this is what we try and capture automatically. And uh, this wheel impact load detector is basically that. I think uh, I will show you a, a small video again, which will tell you the implementation, what we have done. This is an actual implementation. Welcome all. Greetings from Lab to Market. This short video is a walkthrough of RDSO project, FBG based wild. Implemented at LC15, Kenchanahalli, Yelahanka, Bengaluru. Let us begin with the glance at the project site. This cabin is the on site workstation of our scientists. We are now at the entry point of the wild zone. A train wheel moving over the sensors T1 and T2 triggers the system into action. Information from these sensors are conveyed to the system through fiber distribution management system one. This is the measurement zone comprising 20 FVG sensors in all. strain sensors to monitor the vertical load exerted on the rails. These, these, what you see there. Vibration sensors to monitor the oscillations of the rails. The sensors are actually between these two. This is the clamp. And under the rail, there are sensors, FPG sensors. For lateral load sensors to monitor the lateral forces exerted on the rails. All these sensors are connected to FTMS2 and FTMS3. The exit side trigger zone consists of two FBG sensors, T3 and T4. Information from T3 and T4 are routed to the system through FDMS4. When all the wheels recorded at T1 and T2 exit from T3 and T4, the system stops recording the data. This location box houses the entire wild equipment. Signals from all FPG sensors routed through FTMS boxes are connected to the four channels of the interrogator. In this implementation, the east side vertical load sensors and the exit zone trigger sensors are connected to the channel one. Entry zone trigger sensors and west side vertical load sensors are connected to channel two. The lateral load sensors are connected to channel three. The vibration sensors are connected to the channel four. The interrogator sends data to the data processing unit. DPU processes the data and transmits the process data to the Realtel cloud 
through the C dot gateway. Wild system is powered by battery, backed uninterrupted 24 volt DC power supply. The process information is organized in the cloud server for the authorized users to view through a customized GUI. So this is, there are two such system, systems, one in India, Lanka, another is in Whitefield. And they have been working for nearly one year, but still we have certain issues are there which we are sorting out. We, it has not been handed over to the railways yet. The other uh, project that we have time is, now I'm running out of time, so I will speed up. Another uh, project that we have taken up, we call it cyber signaling. And uh, this is basically for management of private railway sightings. Uh, railway sightings are the most neglected aspect of uh, any railways anywhere, though that is where all the railways earn their money in, in because all the goods are loaded and unloaded in that area. Then there is another part of the railways, which I can, uh, I will show you here, uh, like this. This is, this is a photograph from Jindal Steel Works in Ballari, near Ballari. Uh, all steel mills uh, need uh, that use railway infrastructure to carry molten metal from blast furnaces to a steam melting shop. And this, what the big vehicle that you see, they call it torpedo. These torpedo carry at any point of time nearly 400 to 450 metric tons of molten metal. And uh, this, this cannot be, obviously cannot be uh, taken through road. And that's where they need to maintain these railway lines. And they are very poorly maintained. The, the signals are all uh, manual they're, 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 and manually operated. And there are huge problems happen in, in this area. So we have worked uh, for about nearly two years to develop the system for such yards. And one is implemented in this JSW. Uh, this, is, this is a small portion they gave us. It's about, uh, about a kilo, less than a kilometer long portion. There are these are the four eight four unloading points. These are the in the steel melting shop. That is where they pour out the hot metal in the steel melting shop. So three incoming lines to these steel melting shops coming from the blast furnaces, and any train coming on any one of these lines can be guided to any one of these locations through these turnouts or what is known as points. So this point management was a problem for them and uh, drivers will not know what is there further. So this is, this is the overall hardware architecture that we design. And we have given them a solution like this. Every driver now carries a unit like this. It is a ruggedized tablet. And now he knows what is where. These red lines indicate that there are torpedoes here or trains here. One torpedo is parked here. Another one is moving out. So every driver has now the view of the yard. Earlier, they had no idea. The somebody will tell them on walkie-talkie and they will go blindly. So now everybody knows what is happening in the yard. And uh, to operate the points, we created a system, again, using uh, a Wi-Fi network created with C dot device, by which a, even a little girl like this, what you see in the photograph, now can operate the points very safely. I will just operate it. You just notice that he has operated the point. You watch here as the point will move and the signal will change. So now the signal has changed and the light here will, will change over here. I will do it once again. Now you see this is indicating that now the, the point is in the reverse direction. That means the train will take a deviation. Train coming from here will deviate. Now to change that, if I operate it once again, you see now the originally it was in green. That means the train will go straight. Now he has operated it, point has moved, and the signal will change to tell the driver that the signal, the point is now in reverse. So he can take the direction. So this is what we have done. <clears throat> the driver doesn't have to get down to do this. He or she can do it from there. Okay, one more small video to show how it operates. <coughs> The person first chooses the point to operate, gets another view like this, 
then confirms that he wants to operate, point moves, and he gets the indication on the tablet also. The indications are two: one is the roadside, another one is the tablet also that he has made. Then now this is this shows the photograph from inside the cabin. This is one of the lady drivers in JSW, and uh, her assistant. Now she can operate it without getting down. Earlier, the way they were doing it, that they will bring the locomotive to that point, stop it, get down, operate the point, wait for it to go, then get back into the locomotive, move. And then we have to do it four or five times. So you can imagine how much time they were losing per day on doing this. Plus, in the night time, they were also afraid of getting down in the dark and all that. So now they are very, very happy with this system. And the, the uh, Another aspect of that, uh, this is that since now we are recording the data in the cloud, we can give them a lot of other features, a lot of other information. First of all, through a dashboard, we tell them on the day's activity, but they can, uh, they can video play, suppose there has been some accident, then they can play that video back of one day, two days, seven days, 30 days, and, and they can see what, what had ha actually had happened. So, so many, all the statistics of how many points operated, everything is available and that is given. So this is already a system which is working for the last four months in JSW Ballari. The drivers also can set the route. He doesn't have to uh, set the route at every point. He can set the route a priori and illuminate the route. Now this driver has set up this route. This is illuminated. He or she knows that yes, this route is for him. He can go straight there. So then there are some other thing, very important thing we are doing is on the structural health monitoring. There is an uh, organization called K-Rail, Kerala Rail. It's a joint venture of Indian Railways and Government of Kerala. They are setting up uh, a uh, high, semi-high speed railway line between Trivandrum and Kasargod. For that, uh, they want us to develop a structural health monitoring system for all the structures that will come in between the bridges, wire ducts, tunnel, everything they want it to be monitored. So they, they have given us first to prove that, yes, our system will work, and then uh, they will give the full project. So we have that's where we have roped in the SERC in Chennai to work with us. So these are the parameters that we measure in that. And uh, now the work is actually, as I am talking, the experiments are going on in SERC Chennai to validate our FPG sensors for structural health monitoring. And we recently had the first level meeting with them. Uh, we, we have done that and uh, KRL is very happy with that. But now we have to do it with a concrete structure. Now we have we have done with an uh, iron steel structure, I beam. Now we are casting a, uh, a, a structure for which uh, they, they want uh, for us to work. So this work is ongoing now. Then we have done some work which may be of interest to you. This is, uh, we tried on a running train, uh, the monitoring, the, uh, three things. One is the temperature of the axle box, which is a very critical parameter. I also tried to monitor, can I find out if the brake is applied or released? Because that is the primary reason for the wheels getting defective. Can the driver be alerted that the brake has, fail to release or brake is jammed or brake has not applied when he applied. So for that, we conducted an experiment and it was quite successful. What you see is the power car of uh, the Bangalore Chennai Shatabdi. Uh, this uh, lady is, she was an assistant professor, Dr. Sunita at, in IAP at that time. And now she is in Switzerland. Uh, so we, we did this experiment on May 1st, uh, on 2019, but later on uh, the railways people wanted it to be repeated, so we did it again. And we got excellent uh, result. This is what you are seeing is the brake. Now the brake is released. As you can see, the driver has now applied the brake and it is going down. Now the brake is applied. He is again releasing it. He has slowed down, so he's releasing it. Now the brake is being released. So each and every brake, can be monitored, monitored by FCC. Nowhere in the world this has been tried out in, in, in a running place. Nobody has even thought of it. We have, of course, found a patent for this, and uh, we have to. Yeah, so this is this is only at the POC level. We also monitored the temperature. 
of the axle uh, from Chennai, Bangalore to Chennai. As you can see, six in the morning, this is time at 11 o'clock in Chennai. Uh, on the two axles, the one, one the uh, orange and uh, blue indicate the two axle boxes on the same axle. And that's the kind of temperature profile. We were monitoring it every second. So what you see is the temperature that we recorded. The maximum that we recorded, it, what you see is the temperature rise. So the temperature rise of about 90 degrees and ambient temperature being 30. So the temperature of that would have been 120. Currently, they monitored the temperature at fixed points when the train is a stationary. Somebody goes with a gun, infrared gun, and monitors the temperature. But the temperature falls very sharply when the train is a standstill. Only when it is running at good speed, the temperature rises. So we don't really get to know the worst case scenario by the present method. This has a possibility of telling all. We are a ISO 9001 company. We have filed for uh, nine patents. Tenth one will be filed in a day or two. Three have already been granted. We have our trademarks are registered. And do you like this concept? And we would love to partner with you if you like it. So thank you very much, sir. And uh, I think I have taken much more time than I was allotted. But I, I, am, I am OK to stay with you for as long as you want. So thank you very much for your patience. And uh, I now invite any questions, sir. Why was there any questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for such a wonderful lecture. Veena, ma'am, are there any questions there, ma'am, in the chat box? Can you please check me, Veena, ma'am? Hello, sir. Yeah, yeah. Veena, can you uh, moderate the question answer session? Uh, okay. There is, a, sir, one question uh, from Mukti, ma'am. She is asking, sir. Can you please tell about calibration of sensor? Calibration has to be done depending on the application. So for example, in the wild zone, we calibrate in two ways. One is the static calibration in which we have made a system by which we apply load through a, a jack on the track and we use a, a standard load cells to measure how much load has been applied. And then we also uh, monitor the wavelength shift and that wavelength shift is uh, with that uh, is calibrated with the value that we have measured from the load cell. That is the static calibration. But what is more useful is the dynamic calibration. We take a standard locomotive, electric locomotive, which weighs about 123.5 ton WAP7. That's the preferred locomotive for Indian railways. And we run at a low speed of five to 10 kilometer. That is considered at a low, uh, almost like a static weight. So we run over the sensors some four or five times, then they take the average of that and calibrate with that. So these are the two ways by which we calibrate railways, prefer uh, calibration, dynamic calibration with locomotives. Yes. Uh, sir, there is uh -huh. one more question from uh, Joshi, sir. Uh, sir is asking, what about degradation of sensors and how, how often they need replacing? Uh, these sensors, unless they get physically damaged, they don't degrade. They, they work for very long. They have a very long life, actually. Uh, the technology is only about 20 years old. And uh, industrial uh, installations, nowhere it is more than five, six years. So no, we do not know, but the claimed life is 50 years. But we have no data to prove it. And whatever we have placed in the future, unless the cable gets damaged or some physical damage happens, we never had to replace any sensor so far. They, they withstand very high temperatures also. Yeah. So there is one more question from our Dean Research, Dr. M.K. Banga. Uh, sir is asking, uh, great innovation, sir. Uh, I have a query. How is the data secured and managed in L2 MREL? How is data uh, the, secured and managed in L2 MREL? Yeah. We, we, we do not connect uh, to network. Only, only when we want to transmit the data, we connect to the net. And when we connect to the net, we store the data only in the Railtel cloud. We are not uh, storing it in any uh, private cloud because the railways wanted it in their uh, cloud. In, in cyber signaling, we are not connected to the cloud at all. 
we have created our we call it cloud but it's a local cloud there is a server on the in the yard and all the data is stored in the yard and from outside the yard you cannot get into that network at all okay but where in the wild system the security is not so tight because it is only for monitoring it is not for control whereas in jsw we had to have very tight security because we are operating it so we could not take any chances so that is why in in the in the cyber signaling we don't do cloud based systems or we call it cloud but it is a local cloud you you cannot connect from outside so data is security is uh, assured that way uh, sir one more question can we take sir a few more questions sir sir any number yeah thank you so much sir as uh, what um, there is question from panelist what all data processing is required for data acquired from the sensors uh, actually uh, yes that that's that's where we we actually want to engage with academics as much as possible see we are getting tons of data mm -hmm. every day on the two sites if you see we get more than uh, i would say uh, 80 trains each train in an average you you can have about uh, uh, you know 200 wheels uh, so the amount volume of data that we capture is enormous and god knows what all information is hidden in that data so we really need uh, to get deeper and deeper into that but presently we need signal processing uh, to first of all we have to capture data so we have a, a, the, our software architecture is like this there is what we call train data collection module which takes the data from the uh, interrogator into the dpu then inside the dpu we do some kind of a filtering depending on what we want to do with it if we want to do axle counting we simply use a low pass filter but if we want to find out bad wheel we cannot do simple low pass filter because it then uh, you know cuts out lot of other information so we have to do some signal processing to detect what the uh, bad wheel is and also it's not just good or bad <laughs> we have to also tell railways how bad because if it is uh, we we take we tell them if it is a critical alert if the wheel is very bad we are supposed to send an sms to some people they have given some numbers and we are doing it we are sending sms in fact recently railway people have thanked us we perhaps our system in whitefield have avoided uh, one possible accident in a passenger train our system gave an uh, sms of a critical alert the train was stopped at the next station and they found that the one wheel was terrible so they detached that coach so uh, that that that's how uh, the system works but then there is some maintenance alert that maintenance alert means the wheel has a defect but it's not too bad it can go so they have to go and see it so for, for all that we need extensive uh, signal processing and uh, let me tell you that i am not satisfied with what i am doing i am it's working railways are accepting it but there is a huge scope for improvement and uh, we we would love to work with academics it's a it's a wonderful academic uh, exercise to find those problems of course for railways we had a time limit we had to deliver the product and railway says fine it is good with us but i in my heart i know that that's not good enough so we need to work and we are engaging with some uh, professors at iisc also and uh, i am very seriously thinking we are do only doing signal processing but i think we can improve our accuracy by going for machine learning so these have to be explored there is a lot of research scope in this thank you sir sir uh, one more question from preeta sharan preeta sharan is also a co guide of um, deepa uh, oh, she is also here okay yeah, she is also there she uh, deepa preeta sharan all are attending this lecture okay, okay. so so question is from preeta sharan ma'am uh, sir can we will get a real time data of temperature we can do simulation by taking the real time uh, real time data real time data for the temperature on the wild system we can give you we have we have uh, now mounted a temperature sensor on the uh, yalahanka wild mm -hmm. so we are getting monitoring the temperature also because at one point of time we were little concerned about the readings that we result that we were getting and we thought the temperature is corrupting our uh, information but it uh, turned out to be a false alarm with what we did but yes we have a temperature sensor in uh, yalhanka wild and we can give real time information of wild for trains we have 
what I showed you is only a proof of concept. Railway has allowed us to operate it, but they have not given us any uh, work to implement it on that. Even though we have been asking them for a long time, we are going to make the project proposal again because I will be going to Lucknow RDSO soon. And I want to get a project on that. At least I have been begging them to give me at least one train mm -hmm. on which I can mount that. But so far, we haven't got it. So as I told you, the lab to market concept, if you remember in the beginning, I said the user has to fund it. I don't, I don't want IIC or government of India to fund it. Railways want to use it. They have to pay for it. So once railways pay me for it, I will instrument one train for that. That, that's, that's the lab to market concept anyway. The next question is from our Dean, Dr. Srinivas A. Uh, sir, sir is asking, could you please tell us what kind of math modeling is involved in arriving at the in inferences for wheel deformities? Okay, the, uh, we have not done too much of math modeling at this point of time, but initially we did. Uh, the modeling, uh, we created a finite element model of the real, rail and wheel combined, basically to find out how many sensors we need to put to cover the entire circumference of, uh, or to find out the defect. You see, when we are talking about the wild, the bat patch can be anywhere in the circumference. And if you take a typical uh, wheel of, say, uh, the LHP coach of what is runs in Rajdhani, that's about 950 mm, so about 2500 mm circumference in that bad patch can be anywhere whereas FPG is a point sensor so it will detect it has a it has a limited sensing zone so how many sensors do i need to capture the wheel uh, the defect anywhere on the circumference of the wheel for that study we did not want to do it blindly so we did create a model for uh, the wheel uh, we combined an uh, fem and on that, we conducted this. So that was the initial study for about six months we did. And we arrived at the 12 number of sensors with that study. And that proved to be correct also in the field by practical experimentation as well. So that is the only mathematical modeling we have done. But now we are planning a big mathematical modeling to be done, which we have made a proposal to RDSO because they want us to make us develop an instrumented wheel set. Like now in the wild, we have instrumented the rails now they want us to instrument the wheels so that wherever that wheel goes we find out what is the condition of the track so for that we have submitted a proposal already uh, it, that project will be uh, led by professor gopal krishnan of aerospace department because it's mostly to for structures but it is still under consideration we have not got that project as yet that will involve huge mathematical model mm -hmm. thank you sir Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, another question is from Dr. Joshi. Uh, he's asking, who is manufacturing these sensors? If uh, Can they be indigenized? That, that's what we are doing, sir. Actually, these sensors initially we got from China. Hmm. Then you know what happened with China and all that. The railway said that uh, anything uh, from anywhere but China. <laughs> so we started importing it uh, from uh, Czechoslovakia, from US at five times the cost of the same sensor. And now what we are doing is that now that I have got connected to RRCAT and NAL, that, that's where they come in with the picture. So RRCAT gives us the bare sensors. And NAL is working to develop packaging for us because packaging is critically important. These sensors are totally fragile. It's like human hair, you know, coarse human hair that cannot directly be put. So the, the, it requires a lot of expertise to package them so that they can withstand the rigor of that operation. Plus, they should be able to transfer the strain from the rail to the sensor correctly. So NAL has a lot of expert experience in this. They have been using this to monitor the strain on the wings of the aircraft for the last 15, 20 years. So the NAL team has agreed and uh, we are working with them. And I think in, uh, in another about two months, we will have our own sensors, but the bare sensors will come from RRCAT. Packaging will happen at our place, but that will support from NAL. So next one is a very interesting question. Do we have a biotechnology, biological domain for collaboration? 
we are open for everything lab to market does not restrict itself to a particular domain <clears throat> and uh, i dr pita sharan is here she is developing something in the related to life uh, cycle i know that i know yes. her work yes in that direction and um, i have also agreed that once she is ready with that we will look into the commercialization of that as well so yes we we have no uh, we are we are not domain limited the reason why we have up focusing on the railways is uh, because of my co-founder who comes with the railway background and he is a serial entrepreneur in railway domain so it was easy for us to penetrate the railway market see the, ultimately somebody has to pay us money that that is very important okay and have we have done that but once we have a good product uh, we will be taken more seriously you see initially we had we had very serious issues that people were not believing us okay you are saying you can do that but how do we know that you will do it why should i give you money what if if you don't do it i mean how do we answer these questions so but now the situation is very different and now we are getting calls from the rdso their executive directors are calling us can you do this can you do that krl called us we did not go to krl krl called us and asked us can you do this so there is now some credibility we have established and we hope that with this credibility we will be able to penetrate in other domains as well sir one more question is the um, sir had complimented you for the talk sir dr ram kumar uh, sir he is asking for temperature measurement are you using fbga sensors or conventional thermocouples no we are using fbga it's fbga yes sir fbga because in domain it's fbga yes sir uh, uh, question from uh, dr jayati saha she is asking sir how are you are maintaining how you are maintaining the threshold value to give the alert to the railways or what is the procedure to give the alert based on analysis okay that we are actually uh, that that's getting into detail into the wild algorithm actually there are two ways in which we do it one is what we call impact load factor that how much impact load hammering load the wheel has created on the rail on the sensor that is one second thing is sometimes the, the if you have a bad wheel in a fully loaded wagon then the impact may not be much more uh, you know it but the total overall weight itself the dynamic load itself will be very high so uh, we have two parameters one what we call the impact load factor another is we call that uh, maximum dynamic load if this impact load factor and maximum dynamic load exceed a certain value then we classify it as a bad wheel and how much is that will decide whether it is a critical alert or a maintenance alert so those parameters are set by railways rdso sir one more question is from the our curious student abhishek paul sir he is asking in recent days we have seen a lot of railway accidents in northeast india especially in a especially in the steep areas can that be regulated by using the latest technologies mentioned by you yeah most certainly that that's what the hope is we are we are all working for that to towards that end itself how far we will succeed in that we do not know but particularly from northeast railways we have got the general manager has been asking us to come we are not traveling because we are afraid of this covid but uh, uh, the uh, the general manager of uh, north eastern railways uh, has been asking us to come its headquarters near siliguri and uh, he has been tempting us so you come here sir it's a beautiful place we will treat you well this that so they are very keen that we come there and we have a look at them and we do something for them uh, definitely it will help i mean I, we don't claim to solve all the problems definitely not but whatever we are doing definitely it will help no doubt about it uh, so thank you sir there are no more questions at present uh, i think uh, ot mukti ma'am thank you for answering the questions sir thank you so much ot mukti ma'am mukti ma'am thank you sir for the very informative session this will definitely give us some more uh, hope for thinking on what is what all can be done in this field and for our advancement and for students um, projects and advancement as well thank you so much sir i uh, request now Prof. dr dilesha to uh, propose a vote of thanks uh good evening all i am audible yes yeah, sir yes sir yes sir you are audible so we have fortunate to have professor sk sinha a renowned identity from academics and industry as a speaker for this bites event sir has enlightened all of us with presentation on lab to market 
which is very much essential for the academic institute and researchers who might not be familiar with marketing. So to summarize the lecture, Sir has shared his experience, which covered the following points, gaps in the academics and industry in the LTM initiative, how to bridge the gaps and overcome the obstacles of opposite mindset in the LTM uh, initiative. So then LTM uh, strategy or uh, roadblocks, that is development stages to turn our ideas into market opportunities. Then he highlighted the founders of uh, Lab to Market Innovations Private, Private Limited, PSU and academic partners with whom they are working, their current focus, that is challenges and the solutions, the projects successfully developed that are currently working in real time, such as FPG sensors for railway industry that is currently being implemented in India. Another product successfully implemented and currently in working is cyber security in railway signaling. And Sir has also highlighted on other railway safety products that they have developed. So lastly, Sir has provided the clear answers to all the queries raised by the uh, participants. Sir, you have showed us the roadmap and I'm sure many of our academic researchers uh, will continue to do research in this direction in the future. On behalf of DSI and the entire fraternity of the Dansagar University, I extend my gratitude to our honorable speaker, Professor S.K. Sinha, to mm -hmm. take out his um, busy schedule to share his knowledge on the LTM concept. Thank you, sir. Thank yes. you very much for having me. It yeah. was a pleasure talking to all of you. Yes. And I, I you, hope sir. to work with many of you in future. Thank you, sir. We will, it's Thank, a you. Thank you, Thank you, Professor Murthy here. Thank you. I'll get in touch with you and probably we'll take the idea forward. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, special you. thanks to our uh, Vice Chancellor and uh, Chairman Bites, Professor K.N. B. Murthy, who always figure out uh, inviting such eminent speakers for the Bites event, keeping in mind uh, the future and uh, guide us to prepare uh, for it. I extend my gratitude to Dr. R.S. Sinivas, Dean School of Engineering, DSU, who always believe education is not always about the academic skills. Innovation follows closely behind too. And he always prompt and encourage us to make use of our innovation labs for this kind of initiative. I, th I also thank him. I also thank Professor Arvind Sinuas, Professor of Practice, for joining the session. So finally, I thank the deans, chairpersons, principals, and faculties of DSI, the student participants of DSI, for joining the session and making the, uh, this event successful. There are also a few people from other colleges, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Colleges. Yes, yes, another college. Yes, I also thank uh, uh, Photonics Group, Karnataka Group for attending this uh, lecture. So I also thank our people from Case Case Group of Institutions. Case Group. Yes. I also thank the organizers for successfully hosting this event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Namaste, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you, sir. We'd like to meet you soon, sir. Thank you. Sure, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir.